Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Pi Data Day One. Um, real quick, I'd just like to point out Sarah, a member of our um, Code of Conduct team. If Sarah could stand up, please. Awesome. Sarah's in the back. Um, the Code of Conduct team uh, is just a resource and helps um, kind of protect and make this community really welcoming. So um, if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to reach out for it to Sarah. And with that, um, I will introduce uh, our next speaker. Our next speaker is Lucas Durand. Um, Lucas is the head of data science engineering at TD Securities. And today, Lucas will be um, walking us through the process of um, developing an interactive network graph. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, hey, everyone. It's nice to be here. And uh, good morning. It's first thing in the morning. Um, and yeah, thanks for coming out. Breakfast is outside. Perfect. So yeah, today I'm going to talk about understanding people with network graphs in Python. Um, before, I have some slides to start. I apologize, uh, but we will look at them. Um, but uh, before we start, um, I also, in the, the schedule for the event, I put a link to a website uh, that has like an outline for this. It has links to Jupyter Notebooks, um, some links directly to like code spaces. So if you are uh, wanting to follow along, which I recommend, I say jump on that. Um, it should look like something like this. It's at my website. So there's some stuff copied right from the, right from the page, and then uh, some links to different things. There's links to what we're trying to build as an end result. Um, which should be neat. And then, uh, yeah, launch it in Binder, launch it in Code Spaces, clone it, and uh, install the repo locally um, so you can follow along. The way we structured it is there are uh, workbooks that have kind of like what we're trying to do, but stripping out some of it so you can be a part of it and you can write in a couple lines of code to make it all work. And there's also solutions, so if you really have no idea what's going on, you can just follow along there and run the code and uh, customize it as well. A lot of it, we're going to touch on just fundamentals and then hopefully. You can take that, and you can customize it. You can add more to it as you go. Awesome. So let's start with these slides that I promised. Um, awesome. So I kind of said what we were going to do today, intro, creating graphs. Um, next, we're going to get into a, a more like complicated thing where we're trying to add attributes into a graph and then visualize that as well. And then we're going to build an app, which is what we promised. There will be no conclusion. I'm sorry. This uh, slide is out of date. Uh, OK. Uh, awesome. So who am I? Uh, I'm Lucas Duran. My pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, my background is I was a theoretical physicist for some amount of time, uh, and then I moved into the financial space, and I was a quantitative developer, mostly building low latency algorithms for pricing uh, fixed income instruments. Uh, and then I moved into the data science and software engineering space. And since then, the last six or seven years, uh, I've been with TD Securities, building out a Jupyter Notebooks uh, Python analytics platform. Uh, log in, do your analytics, uh, enjoy it, right? Um, and so that's all very exciting. My instrument of choice is the saxophone. Mostly the tenor, sometimes the berry. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have it with me today, or else we could have had a totally different talk uh, with music involved. Uh, and then I love Python. Um, also, I work with TD Securities, which is the capital market side of TD Bank, um, which is growing in the United States right now, but we're a Toronto-based bank where I'm from. Um, if you're interested in a job, talk to me. I'm obligated to say that. All right. Uh, that's how I got here today. Awesome. So let's ground the talk today in a bit of a problem statement. So. If you've ever worked for a big company, especially one that doesn't have a robust like, network graph solution already in place, um, it, it's your first day. You might know what you're working on, hopefully. Uh, you might have a little like, wiki page that says, here are your onboarding instructions. Um, and you might know who you work for, and you might have met them, which is great. Uh, but beyond that, it's kind of hard to know who your other people are, who are your peers in the organization. And uh, that's something that we're going to try and solve with network graphs. So, a lot of the times, you might have a kind of half-baked solution. Here's an example of something that may or may not be from my organization, um, which is now outdated. But uh, maybe you have a view of like who's on your team, who reports to you, which is great. But we kind of knew that already. You might know who else reports to your manager, which is great. This is your like wider team. And maybe you can start to traverse this and find out other people. But usually, there's a pagination problem going on. It's not really clear who's really close to you. And this is just reporting structure. So there's a lot of places where this breaks down. Uh, so a lot of uh, organizations report based on uh, project teams. And so anyone who's not on your project is hard to find. Um, capabilities are sometimes another reporting structure. So maybe you're in an engineering group. And it's great. You know other engineers. But it's not really clear who's worked on similar projects or who has similar interests. Uh, that sort of data is not, not really captured. right? Um, 
And then finally, especially in the data and analytics space, it's really, really uh, typical to have embedded data scientists or embedded data analysts, which is essentially saying, like, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a data scientist, and I'm the only one on my team, right? So who else do I talk to? Maybe there's a community group that exists, and maybe that was part of your onboarding instructions, and that would be great. But if there's not, how do you find these people? How do you build communities, right? So um, basically, what's the org chart plus? We want to take the org chart, which shows you like, who you work for and where you fit, uh, and to try to extend that by adding more attributes, finding new ways to connect to people. OK, so um, before we dive in, what are network graphs? Uh, I don't want to go entirely into it, besides the fact that network graphs are like a mathematical object. They have some rules and properties. Uh, and especially if we're using it um, and the algorithms associated with gr graphs and graph theory, there's a lot of powerful things we can do once we represent data in the structure. Uh, so there's, yeah, there's three things we want to talk about. One is the graph itself. Uh, it's made up of objects. The objects can be connected to each other. And uh, they can also hold like attributes or data. Um, so an easy way to think about it is like a graph is a bunch of uh, like dictionaries. And then there's some other rule that maps the dictionaries together. right? Uh, or they're like some sort of linked object. right? Um, the actual objects inside of it we call nodes. Other people might call them vertices or points, but I like nodes. Uh, and then the nodes contain attributes. Um, that's, that's what a node is. And then finally, edges connect nodes together. Uh, edges can be directed, so like they can point in one direction only, or they can point in both directions. Uh, in more complicated graphs, you can have multiple edges between any two points, sure. Uh, and then they can also have weighting to them, which is like an importance or if you think of them, which we will later, as springs, it's like how springy they are. Um, and that's it. That's, that's network graphs. Um, so if you're satisfied, you can leave now. Um, but you can stick around, and we'll do more as well. Cool. So if we actually want to create a graph, um, the simplest way to start with this is to say nodes are people. right? We just load all our people data into there. And then we say edges are the management structure. And what we end up with, if we draw this, is probably what you've already seen before, which is like a tree uh, representation of an organization or a reporting structure. Um, and so it should look familiar. Like we have this fellow, David Chapman, who is a, a made up person. And they have a lot of people reporting to them. So all those lines are going up into David Chapman. right? Uh, and similarly, we can start to see um, Amy Todd over here uh, sort of near David Chapman. Um, and James Chen is near Amy Todd. And if we were actually looking at that old view of the org, this is a number of pages away. So we have to go from James Chan to David Chapman up to someone off screen we can't see, back to Amy Todd. And so we have some like degrees of connectivity here that's easier to see when we visualize it with this simple graph. So this is a pretty good org chart. I think everyone should have this at least. Uh, but I also think we can do better. Um, so how do we do better? Let's introduce those new attributes. Uh, so there's a paper link down here that's a really good overview of, of this approach. But essentially, the idea is to uh, use the power of the graph itself and introduce uh, variables, attributes that are already in the nodes, and then have that uh, influence how the graph structures itself. Um, so there's, there's lots of ways to like look at connectivity here. Here in this like pretty messy, arguably pretty messy looking graph, um, we added some things in. So here you can see like TypeScript, Python, Java, JavaScript. These are programming languages, um, <laughs> obviously. Uh, and then we also have, it's kind of hard to see, but at the bottom, UTC. And so in this graph, we added time zones and we added uh, programming languages. And every person in the graph is re uh, associated with these as well. So you can see like UTC connects to a number of different people, but not everyone. Uh, and then, yeah, Python, Java, TypeScript, exactly, right? These are all connected to different people. Uh, and then the sort of magic that we can do with the graph is to use uh, like a physics simulator and to treat all of the nodes as uh, objects being pulled together by springs and being uh, repulsed by each other, and allow a, a physics engine to do what we call a force-directed layout, and to solve the equation to an equilibrium where um, basically like similar points will end up pulling closer to each other. So in theory, and this is the approach we're going to take, uh, we should be able to uh, build a graph, add in these attributes, allow it to solve itself, uh, and then we'll have these like regions or neighborhoods starting to emerge from the graph where uh, similar people are together. And I think in this one, uh, the colors of people are based on uh, teams they're on. And so we do see some like team mixing happening, which we wouldn't have seen before in the earlier graph, where essentially teams are all isolated together in little groups. Uh, but here they're being pulled and pushed together by 
similarity of, of like both, both using Python or like both being in the same time zone, despite the fact that their team might be split uh, across different areas. Awesome. So what we want to do at the end of this is to build an app where we can explore this more, share this with other people. Maybe it's part of your company onboarding, uh, or maybe it's just part of uh, how you try to understand how people are related or connected. And so what we want to do is use a library called Dash Cytoscape. Uh, Cytoscape is a JavaScript library in order to build out uh, this, this graph that you can uh, tweak the attributes and variables that we want to look at, maybe color and style it on the fly, uh, and maybe give it to someone who doesn't know Python and doesn't want to go through the notebooks. Um, but we'll also have all the steps getting there. Um, some other notes is like, as we add more and more things, it's going to get messy. It looks pretty big. Um, but this is kind of like a neat look at what it could look like as an end goal. Uh, we see the different clustering and clumping happening. Um, this is kind of neat. You can also see the graph has arranged itself with a lot of these um, like big identifiers. Like these are apps and uh, programming languages. So there's like uh, JavaScript, but then there's also Tableau. Um, and they're all on the outside pulling nodes into different areas. Um, and so that's, that's how we're getting these clumpings uh, happening. Um, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And then lastly, uh, there's more things we can do with graphs as well. Um, so typically, they're used for a lot of different purposes. The one on the left is showing like API dependencies. And so APIs depend on other APIs, which depend on other APIs. So like, that's a very common way to use network graphs, not just for people. And on the right, we have a similar thing with reporting structure, but we represent uh, attributes with like colored circles. So um, there's a couple ways to approach it. Uh, we're going to go with making that big, messy graph and then solving it and trying to see how it looks. Awesome. That's all I wanted to talk about for slides. Now we can actually jump in and do some Python, which I think is exciting. Uh, so yeah, if you haven't yet, um, you can go to the site. And we're going to start with uh, the data section. We're going to generate some data. Um, in order to do this, typically you'd start with some like nice, clean data from your organization or from a community all filled in. Uh, but we don't have that. Uh, I can't give you ours. Uh, and so what we're going to do is use a cool library called Faker to generate a population of sample people. Uh, and then we're going to use some other libraries to try and fill it out a little bit more. And we're going to get this like nice population of people. After that, we can load them into a graph. Then we can add those clustered attributes. And then we can start to play around with it uh, with uh, Plotly, Dash, and uh, Cytoscape in order to, to visualize it interactively. Awesome. Uh, so definitely grab the workbook. I think this link workbook here opens it to like a GitHub code space, or it's close to a code space. You can click a button and get the code space. Um, that's what we'll do. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to switch over now to VS Code. Cool. Let's just get full screen as well. Cool. So people, what are they? How can we re represent them in a meaningful way? Uh, so like I mentioned, we don't have real data with us. So we want to start making some data that looks real. Uh, so a cool Python library for generating fake data or sample data is Faker. They have good docs. Um, basically, the way that it works uh, is that <clears throat> you provide it, uh, or you, you ask it for different, it has these things called providers. Let's, let's start there. Um, and they provide different kinds of data. Um, it also has a concept of locales. And so depending on what like, locale you register it in, it'll generate different kinds of data. Um, this is cool because uh, we don't always have everybody showing up in the United States. Uh, we don't always have people in North America or the Western side of the world. And so being able to have locales and generating data that looks more like that data uh, is really powerful. Um, it also means that if we wanted to, we could use these locales uh, to talk about, like, for us, we're going to generate like a company profile. Uh, and we can make, make different company profiles if we wanted to, like big company, googly company, Microsoft-y company, right? Uh, with different rules about how people work and how they're connected. Cool. So uh, the first thing we can do, um, which I suggest uh, you do, uh, is uh, Faker uh, has this uh, profile um, provider. And this is combining a lot of their different providers together. But it's a kind of view of like what a person looks like, um, or like a kind of cookie cutter person. Uh, so. Uh, we could take a look at this and, and start to play around with it. So this person is a recycling officer. That's cool. They work for a company. They have a social uh, security number. Um, it looks like they live in, um, I, d I actually don't know where this is, but uh, interesting. Um, they have a blood group. A lot of this information potentially not really relevant to us. Um, although like maybe we want to introduce people in our company to other people with the same blood type. But I, I really don't see a purpose for that. It seems like a recipe for disaster in the HR department. 
Um, uh, we have names and uh, sex and uh, their ad address, uh, which is different than their residence because this is very random. So like maybe this isn't exactly what we need out of the box, um, but it's something, right? Um, cool. Other things Faker does, if we're just playing around with it here, is we can ask for unique values. So uh, it, it'll keep uh, track of what random uh, values have been chosen so far. And if we want, we can ask for uh, just unique values. So here I'm going to like loop through and get all the prefixes out from pre the random prefix. Uh, and I can run that. And it'll go. I get uh, all of them out here. But uh, I'm enforcing this uh, condition that they be unique each time. Um, <clears throat> And so I, I get to the end of the list, essentially, and then I'm sad because there's no more prefixes. right? Um, not a very good use case for prefixes, which uh, presumably, well, one, don't really matter. <laughs> but uh, they, uh, you know, we'd have duplicates of this across a larger population. It, it would be interesting, but potentially strange to have uh, like a unique representation of, of prefixes for everyone in the company, and to just have, what is this, like eight people in a company. That would be an interesting hiring strategy. Okay. So let's uh, try to generate a couple people now and see if this profile makes sense, right? So we can go in here and uh, generate a couple profiles, um, maybe 10 of them. And so it's, it's interesting. Um, we definitely have different people. This maybe is obvious based on the conversation so far, but we have a geochemist and a heritage manager and uh, Sandra, I don't know what Sandra does um, because you know the output was truncated. But maybe maybe we should limit the options for these things. Like th there's a lot of job titles here that maybe aren't in our company, uh, and people are all over the place as well. So what we could do is is to try and establish like what are the roles that we should have in a company, where people should be. Maybe we pick a couple different offices, and then uh, if we really wanted to do it, we could also say like certain teams or like lines of business are only in certain regions or they're in different regions. And then that gives us something that like kind of looks like a real company. Um, OK, before we do that, um, we looked at Faker. We decided maybe Faker doesn't do what we want out of the box. Um, but what's great is we can register new providers in Faker um, and use all the functionality that's built into it, um, which is mostly like drawing random things and then potentially using this unique uh, function as well. Um, cool, but um, we can register new providers. So if we wanted to register a new provider for, say, employment status, we could do that. And so I can import this dynamic provider. Um, and I can say, like, let's call this thing employment. These are the options for it. And then we'll just like uniformly draw from these when we're trying to make a, a cool person, a cool person, a random person. Uh, and then I register this. And now when I call fake employment, I get full time. And if I ran it again, I'd get contract, part time, contract, right? Uh, so now we can add this in and start to build out our person a little further. Um, like I mentioned, this one's like a uniform random distribution, um, which is neat, but not necessarily exactly what we want. So another way we could do this is we can make a custom provider. And so we can uh, inherit directly from the base provider class and like build out a, a provider around here. So in this case, um, we're doing the same thing with employment status, but I'm uh, like keeping a dictionary here of what the value should be and then a weighting. So I can do a random weighting to my draws. Uh, so in my company, I've decided it's 70% full-time, 30% contract, and then another 5% part-time. Uh, so we are a little overstaffed at the moment, but it's still, still a great company to work for. Please come work for us. Um, awesome. And then I define what my function should be. And then here, I'm using a bit of more iter tools, which I really like, uh, to get one value um, from random choices uh, of this list of statuses. So I'm saying. Uh, with random choices, you, you pass in uh, a list of what the options are and then another uh, potential optional list of the weights. And so I put in the weights from the dictionary and the options from also the dictionary. Uh, and now when I run this, um, and this isn't a very good visual example, I should get full time more often. You could believe me. You could also like run it and then see, like run, run 10 of them and see maybe it should look like that. We could do that. Um, you know. Look at 10 of these. And uh, a lot of full timers. Um, but that kind of makes sense. That checks out. This isn't a horribly, we didn't break statistics today. Not yet. Um, awesome. So um, these are a, a, some building blocks. Now we want to build what an actual person looks like. Uh, so we want to do a tech focused person. Uh, they work for a tech company or a company with a tech department. We'll focus on that. Um, I kind of tried to 
try to ground this with some different data structures to just fill in so that we end up with things that have the same names at the end of it. Um, but this isn't strictly necessary. Um, I've also just really been playing around with data classes in Python recently, and I like to use them maybe more than I need to. Um, but I think it's a neat way to set up a data structure that has some like strict fields in it. Uh, so here we're importing all the data class stuff. Uh, I set there's a time zone. It's an enumeration. Um, we'll say there's Eastern, Pacific, and UTC. Um, we could create this like location that people are in. It should be like a city, a time zone, and a country. We could probably automate the creating of that because cities are always in a certain time zone or country as long as the city name is unique, right? Um, and then, yeah, we have a person in our company. So we talked about some of the things that we, we like care about for a person. Um, so I figure they should have a name. This is some like unique identifier. Uh, a hiring date sounds like something that most people have. Um, they should have a, an employment status. This is like the full-time, part-time, or contract. We just made that uh, fake, fake provider, so we're good on that front. Um, and then we should have some languages. They should probably know zero to n programming languages, right? Um, not everyone needs to, um, although maybe if we got a little deep into it, we can make sure that uh, nobody has like the developer or engineer title if they don't know one language. That might be reasonable. Um, maybe not. Depends how you're, you're labeling things. But we can get like pretty deep into all the rules that we want to establish generating fake data. Awesome. Uh, and then everyone needs a manager that helps us build the reporting structure. Uh, and then probably we want to give people like team, title, uh, we just said title, and location. Cool. Um, so yeah, we can make a, a person here um, and see how it works. Um, so maybe this person is me. Um, I know me well. So that's me. Uh, my hire date was uh, sometime in the past. Um, I don't know. It's like 2016, uh, July 1st. That seems right. Um, my status is full time, right? Um, so this isn't very exciting. Uh, I, I get it. Um, we got Python. We got Scala. We got JavaScript. That seems good for now. Um, and then, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking I just leave the manager for now because there aren't any other people for me to refer to. So this could be a problem. Already I'm thinking we have to do this in two passes. We have to set up people and then decide how they report to each other. Um, and uh, yeah, my team is uh, whatever, like data science. Uh, and then uh, my title is uh, whatever, head of. Um, but probably also when we're generating people, we don't want to do it this way. Um, we want to set up base people, maybe where they are geographically, and then decide like, what their jobs are based on that. Cool. OK, so we have a person class now. Um, so let's reuse whatever we can from Faker and add some more of our own fields. Um, so I figured we should do this programming languages thing. Let's add a new provider for this. Um, so I already started it off here. We have Python. Uh, like Apparently 50% of the people in the company know Python, um, which I think is really cool. Maybe we'll keep that in. Uh, I want to work there. Uh, unfortunately, where I work more looks like Java 50%, but that's OK. Um, lots of people do front end. Let's put in some JavaScript here. Um, they don't have to sum to 100, which is really nice. Um, don't put Java again. Oops, go away. Cool. Uh, so yeah, now we can have Java, or not Java. Maybe, maybe we know Go. That seems like something we know. Uh, but less of us know that. Uh, cool. So now we can add this provider, and I can pull out uh, some fake number of programming languages. Awesome, and I broke this. Um, I did not finish writing this in. Uh, cool. So just like we did before, we want to pull random choices, right? Um, our population is going to be, uh, what, what are the options here? So this is like list languages, um, right? And then the weights are going to be the values, so it's just what we did before. Uh, I think we have to call list on this, but uh, two, awesome. Um, so I did it wrong again. Um, maybe this isn't population. Maybe I was wrong about that. Cool. So now I'm just getting one programming language. Um, that's not super exciting. I wish we would get more. Uh, I think like a person could have multiple, not just one. Uh, so probably what we want to do is go in here and add another uh, parameter. I think choices takes uh, a number, so k. Uh, so here, k equals 1 is the default. But I could also pull out three, three programming languages. Um, but probably I want to pull out like a random number of programming languages between 0 and something, right? So I probably want to like add in a new uh, a new amount of randomness here, right? Uh, I could think I can do zero to five. Cool. 
So now a person has like some different number of programming languages. Um, somewhere in this notebook that maybe has disappeared, I think I made a, a helper function for doing this. Uh, I might have inadvertently deleted it, and now it's only in solutions. But uh, oops, you can check there. But uh, um, something that I was using uh, in that other notebook is uh, doing like a dynamically weighted. So we can really go nuts with this and say, uh, basically do this random choices for k, but then weight it so then it hits lower numbers more often. So then we have some like outlier developers that know five languages, but like 60 or 80 percent know zero, one, or two. Like that's things we might care about. Maybe that's useful later. Uh, but we don't really need to go like entirely into this. I think we can get a, a reasonable looking organization with just this. Cool. So now we know fake programming languages. Um, the last thing I was talking about was let, let's get like a little little wild with team title and location and say that like certain teams are in certain areas and that certain teams have certain roles associated with them. Um, so let's start off and like define some dictionary mapping team names to roles and then say that certain uh, cities have certain teams in them. Uh, so maybe like uh, our team title here is uh, product and we have some engineers and a AVP or something like that. Maybe throw in like a VP on the top. Um, and then we say Seattle has like a couple different uh, product groups in them. They have product, business, and sales. That's cool. Um, so we now like need product, uh, business, and sales. Sales probably doesn't have engineers, so they're probably like salesperson, product, sales. I don't know. I don't talk to a lot of salespeople. It's okay. Uh, and then business. Uh, maybe business is like uh, I don't know. Associate. Oops. Associate, and then. Uh, Maybe, I don't know, director or something like that. That sounds like someone who works in the business. Uh, cool. So we have these different things. I can add in another. Maybe you want like uh, DevOps. Um, and then we have like engineer, or senior engineer, right? So we can have some uh, title overlap. And maybe they mean the same things, which is neat. Um, and then we have allowed teams per office. So here we said Seattle has sales, product, and business. Um, maybe we say uh, our Toronto office uh, has the DevOps team and then a bit of the product team, but no business. Uh, and then maybe we have like London uh, and they have uh, sales and business, right? Um, so we can write this out. We can add this, add to this. We can sort of customize it and uh, tweak it as we go. We can come back to it as well. Uh, cool. Now we, we said we define the offices as well. Okay. So we said there's one in Seattle, there's one in Toronto. Uh, Toronto is in EST, country is Canada. Um, London is in uh, UTC, and the country is uh, G GB, GB, GBR? That sounds right. Um, <laughs> cool. So now we've defined these different things. And basically, the way that this should work is we want to pick uh, a team for a person. So we generate our person, and then we want to pick a title, a team, and return like what that is. So um, put potentially in that order. Uh, it seems like it wouldn't be in that order. Um, so how do we pull out a, like a, not a unique, but how do we pull out a triple uh, from these three different objects? Uh, so we have team titles. They map from the like team name to what the roles are. We have office locations, which is uh, a city to the team names. So it looks like the, the like flow pattern here is to go from uh, location, then determine a team that could be there, and then determine what your role is, right? Um, so probably we want to go first and say like my location equals, uh, we can just use the random from fake because I was too lazy to import it. Um, random choice from, uh, what is this? Uh, allowed teams per office. Looks like I didn't run this also. Uh, cool. and then. The title is probably uh, uh, random choice from uh, location, uh, right? That should be in there. And then the actual team, um, that was team. And then title, we could pull from our team titles thing, right? Cool. Uh, we are getting there. We are getting there. Title. Uh, sweet. Um, 
Cool. I was a bit lazy here. Where were our locations? Offices. Yeah. I think this is city, actually. Offices, city, title, title, team. Cool. Did that? Did I break it? Well, this part isn't fun anymore. Um, you know what? Let's switch over. Uh, if you're following along, I strongly suggest you do. It's so much fun. Um, <laughs> awesome. Um, cool. So we, we have these uh, things that we just built together, right? Put together. Um, cool. We have some programming languages. We have some people. Um, in this one, define like way more team titles, right? We have DevOx, Dev DevX, developer experience. DevOps, sales, support, whatever. Um, but the same structure that was there before. Um, and then we, we took some random choices. This is choose a few is also the thing I mentioned before, which is our um, like weighted, uh, weighted towards the bottom random chooser. Cool. Um, so now we can make a person. Uh, it's pretty simple. We get the title, team, and city for the person, um, which if we looked here, should be like a location title. Right? Um, that all makes sense. And now we can create a person. This is really exciting. Um, we've generated random people. Now we just want to know, like, does this make sense? Um, it seemed to make sense. I spoke confidently that this was a good idea. But we should probably validate that it makes sense. Um, anyways, we're, we're passing this all into our data class person, which is great. And they know programming languages. They have an employment status. right? They have some hiring date. Um, awesome. So what we can do is load this into a data frame, because we like data frames. And we can see some people. right? So it seems like they have um, names and statuses, and they know different amounts of programming languages, which is also exciting. We like that. Um, now all we have to do is set up their reporting structure. right? Uh, I think for some reason I missed this. So yeah, they have titles, they have locations, and they have teams. They just need a manager. Uh, this is great. So we can also get a little wonky with how we want to define managers. right? Our manager is always in the same city. Our manager is always uh, in the same team, probably. Let's do that. Um, and then maybe managers should have a title that's like equal to or greater than yours. Probably greater, but um, I don't know. Maybe maybe there can be like same level reporting as well. Um, cool. So we can treat that list we made of titles up here uh, as like uh, being uh, you know increasing in in rank throughout, and that'll help us on that journey. Um, and yeah. Uh, so this part, if we're following along, it's a little uh, wonky. I apologize. Um, but here we're going to calculate ranks for different people. So uh, we're just saying like the rank is based on that uh, dictionary of lists. So for each of these different entries in the list, we'll say um, we'll, we'll take like a, a count of how many are in the list and then you know, rank them accordingly. So uh, DevOps, like engineer one, senior engineer two, and we go up from there. Um, similarly, um, for like product, it goes engineer, manager, product owner, AVP, VP, right? This just helps us sort it in the future. If we wanted to, we could just uh, sort it in pandas as like a categorical list, but I thought this was a little bit easier. Uh, now we'll go through our data frame, um, and we will go team by team and then apply those ranks. And what we should get out is something, a new column called rank. Um, this is just going to help us um, decide who's a manager, because we say their rank has to be bigger or the same. And then here's some like wacky pandas code um, that I don't want to get too deep into. But basically, what we're doing is saying like we're going to look at um, some subset of the data frame. So we'll group by team, and then that'll be like a subset of the data frame. And we're going to look at um, filtering it so that you only look at people who have a greater rank than the person we're looking at, or the same rank, right? And then we'll just take the first one that meets that criteria, preferring someone of greater rank, right? And uh, we'll just plop their name down as the supervisor. Um, this is also like keeping the sorting of the data frame in place. So in theory, we should, if somebody is uh, of rank 5, right, um, they should get picked up by people all of rank 4 of the same team. So we'll have a lot of people reporting to the same person, which is kind of vaguely what we want to do. right? Um, awesome. So we can run this, and uh, it'll go through and now assign managers to people. Uh, so that's it. We have our data frame. We have our fake people. Um, Rhonda Rivas is a contractor. Started in 2022, Larry Rubio is their manager. Uh, they work on DevX, they're an engineer, they have a location and a rank. Um, the rank we no longer really need, but 
Um, maybe we'll want to use it later for something. Um, awesome. So um, what we end up having here is uh, we have a lot of team leads at the top, so they don't necessarily have someone to report to. Uh, and then we just need to now hire a CEO, um, decide on what their salary is, um, probably too much, and uh, then assign all those like floating people to them. So now we have each of the team leads, uh, and probably not multiple team leads, but I didn't really check. Uh, and then we just need to set them uh, as the CEO being their, their uh, person. So we did that here. We made the CEO with our same make person function. Then we overrode some of the inputs. We said, like, they should be on their own team called CEO. They're full time, whatever. Um, we set their location. Oh, this is like a normalization thing. Let's skip that. And then we added the CEO into our uh, data frame. So they're in there now. Um, the next thing we need to do is uh, just update anybody who doesn't have a manager to report to the CEO which we are doing here with this location uh, statement. And then we can also set some rank for the CEO because it breaks things later on um, when we want to use rank. So cool, now we have a CEO, they're in the company, and we should have everything. Um, sort of a, a implementation detail is we had that location um, object in our data frame, and doesn't necessarily play well with everything. So we can flatten that out and make new columns for each entry in the location. So we're kind of like flattening out our data frame. Um, easy way to do that is to like apply series across the column. Um, it's not super fast, but it works for this purpose. Uh, yeah, and then now we can jump into Plotly and take a look and make broad, sweeping statements about whether this is a good idea or not or whether it works. Um, fantastic. Uh, right, so with Plotly, um, if you haven't used it before, uh, it has a kind of grammar of graphics -y interface. We can put in a pandas data frame and then provide different column names to it, and it will uh, generate and change the way that it's appearing uh, based on what the values are in those uh, columns. So we can pass in our data frame here. We can say, like, let's look at the titles of people um, as x. We could say, I mean, I kind of dove all the way in into this one. So we said, let's look at the titles on the bottom here with x. Uh, let's color the different um, entries in the bar graph based on the team that they're on. And then I said, let's make facets, so it's breaking out, out into subplots based on the country that they're in, right? And so in this view of things, we have lots of information. Um, but I think like the takeaways here are like, um, if you look at Ireland on the far right here, uh, there's only two teams represented, which is probably what we set up before, <laughs> but uh, sort of a uh, uh, skipped over, so there's a bunch of folks from the DevOps team are here. Uh, they don't seem to be anywhere else, so that's that's probably fine. And then all the folks from support are here as well, um, which is also probably fine. Um, Canada has a real mix of different teams. I think we set it up that way. Um, I guess the other things are there's only one CEO, so we didn't mess that up, which is good. Uh, and there's a whole ton of engineers, um, maybe too many, um, but maybe this is just a really engineer focused. Everyone has that title. Um, just one managing director, that's probably fine. Um, but we can have, like, does this look like a company? Um, it certainly is maintaining some of those distribution effects that we wanted it to do, right? We have people in different companies, teams in different company, or countries, rather, and uh, different roles in each team, right? Um, potentially fewer and fewer of the higher level roles. Um, cool. OK. So we're going to call this uh, a huge success. We created sample data. Um, but it's kind of it's leaving some to the imagination. Like, what does this organization actually look like? Uh, in order to do that, um, I think the best way is to jump into the next section, um, which is looking at uh, building a graph and then visualizing the graph. It will become more apparent when we do that. Awesome. Let's jump into that. Don't, don't give it away too soon. Um, awesome. So understanding people, now we can really start doing what we wanted to do. Uh, so what we're going to do today with this data is we're going to use Network X. So Network X is an in-memory um, graph representation. Um, it's written in C or Fortran or both, maybe. And uh, so it's quite fast. Uh, it's a good way to represent graphs. And uh, it comes with a whole host of um, graph algorithms uh, built into it. Um, so once you transfer the way that you're looking at data into a graph, graph first, um, you can start to answer questions that will be harder to do um, using something like a pandas data frame or just like normal Python objects. Even doing what we just did before, which was uh, 
assigning managers based on all these rules would be a lot easier to do um, in a graph representation, um, but you know, we weren't here yet. We were still in the first notebook. We didn't know about graphs. So how do they work? Here's the, here's the, quick, the quick on this. Uh, they also have great docs, good tutorial um, that I stole some of this from. Um, so check that out, too, if you're sort of lost. Um, so it's easy to load data in. Um, you can add nodes. Nodes can have attributes. Um, you can pass attributes as uh, keyword arguments when you're adding a node like this, single node. Um, or you could pass them in as like a dictionary of attributes, which is great. And uh, they typically want a label. Um, for us, we'll probably use like people's names. Um, but a better idea would use like their unique identifier, their like person ID, something like that. So yeah, we can add a node in. It's me. I'm a person. I know Python. Uh, we can also do it from an iterable. So this is you and them. Um, and they have some other languages they know. But we're doing this from like a, um, an iterable of tuples, right? With the, the first being like the label, and then the rest being the attributes. This is using the dictionary. Uh, and then we can look at them. Um, so we can look at nodes, and we see all three of them are in there. It's in the graph now, me, you, and them. Um, we can also get all those attributes out if we wanted to. And it's sort of represented and can be accessed like a dictionary of dictionaries, um, which is cool by saying data equals true. And if we wanted to, um, we could just get out specific attributes as well by specifying data equals whatever that attribute is. So here we said languages, but we could also say, like, uh, uh, what was the other one we did? Person. And it'll say, like, um, oh, sorry, type. And type should say, like, person, right, for everyone, because we said that when we made them, um, which is great. So we can use that to filter or to uh, iterate through and uh, get that data back out. Cool. Um, finally. Uh, to make it really powerful as a graph, we want to add edges. And so the edges will connect two of these nodes together. Um, in our case, our gra uh, graph we initialized as just a regular graph. Um, there's other options as well, um, most notably a directed graph, which is di graph, or di graph. And uh, so right now we're going to add edges, but they don't really point anywhere. Um, but in a directed graph, they can point. Um, cool. So I'm going to connect me and you, and you and them. And the edge connection label is friends, so like we're all friends now. Um, well, I mean, me and you are friends, and you and them are friends. But uh, is there a way we can uh, all become friends? So uh, a way we can use the graph is find the shortest path between nodes. It's going to follow those edges. So I could say, how do I get from me to them? And it is, it's through you. So this is great. Um, we're, we're either all friends, or we know how to connect through our friendship. Friendship is bringing us together. Um, and there's a couple other interesting uh, features of the graph as well. Like we can just get all that connectivity information out through the adjacency uh, um, view of the graph. Um, and finally, we can also visualize, which is fantastic. And I apologize for the white background. Um, we will fix that later. Um, but great, like we can visualize a graph now. So in theory, we have all we need to now visualize this group of people based on their, their connections, right? We know how they connect based on management. So let's keep going through that. Um, great. Um, I was lazy, so let's just reload everything from the last notebook into this one. Fantastic. OK, so how do we add nodes? Um, we, we need to create a new graph for ourselves now. And then we'll probably want to iterate over all the nodes and pass them in and register them in our graph. right? Um, so it turns out not too hard to do. Um, we can do that by, uh, <clears throat> by making this generator here. Um, there's other ways you can do it, of course, but uh, I figured dumping our dictionary into, or sorry, dumping our data frame into a dictionary, um, and then iterating over that and piping it into our graph was pretty simple one-liner to do that. Um, some other ways we'd want to do that is to maybe look at, um, or some other things to consider are, we're, we're starting to create nodes like on mass, um, and we know that later we want to create other types of nodes. And so we might want to label these nodes in some way that will be easy to identify them later. And so um, what we did was we added, sorry, this is kind of a, we added in a, a person flag, so person equals true. Um, for some reason, also type equals person, so some redundancy there. But um, future myself needed it for some reason, and uh, it's here now. Um, so now we have potentially a whole graph of different people. Um, and we can get out all the, all the data inside of them. Um, based on how we did this, we actually embedded both like the name of the person as the label for the node, and then also the entire 
um, like row of that data frame, that entire object, uh, as the attributes. Um, so if we run this, we should get back people from our graph. So Edward Chen is in here. Um, he's a person. His type is person. His name is here. Um, and then uh, we get all the other information as well, like the hire date. Um, can I scroll this? No, not too well. Uh, the status, part-time, languages, what they know, right? Who their manager is, Jennifer French, right? Um, and their team. So our data is in the graph now. Hmm. And now what we need to do is, is visualize it. That's what we said we were here for, right? So awesome. Um, as we said before, um, this is using matplotlib. Sorry, we didn't say that part before. This is what it uses. Um, all we need to do is pass in our graph to the draw function, and we should get back a graph. And here's our beautiful graph of all the people in our organization. They're all blue blobs, and they're in a big circle. Um, now, this isn't very great. Uh, it, it doesn't really provide us a lot of information. Um, we haven't connected anybody yet. So we need to add the edges into our graph, and then we should be able to draw this in a little more meaningful way, um, just based on how they're, they're connected. So um, before that, I thought it would be fun to add some color. So the Network X uh, draw feature allows us to provide um, what does it allow us to provide a, a like node color argument? Um, and the node color argument is going to let us, uh, where did I say this? Um, it's going to let us provide colors for each of the nodes, right? We want to do this based on some attribute that's already in the graph. Uh, so I thought it would be good to do it by team. Um, we know that teams all report internally, right, up their structure to each other. And so maybe we want to. We want to look at those and differentiate teams as well as individual people. Uh, so in order to do that, we need to have some way to map teams to people. Um, this is a real fun one. Uh, so here I took, uh, we're using the Plotly library I mentioned, um, which I probably imported at some point. Um, and uh, it has a number of different color scales. Basically, we want to associate like each unique value from teams um, with a color. And then we want to generate that whole big list for each node and pass that into our draw function. Uh, so here we have something, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of different color scales you can check out from, from uh, Plotly Express. Um, the qualitative ones are pretty good because they're designed to uh, represent like categories. But um, if you use something like diverging, the colors will slowly change, um, which is not really good at differentiating fully different things. Um, but here, yeah, we could use anything. I can switch it up just for fun. Like dark two sounds exciting. Uh, I want to find out what that is. Um, so that's that's an option for us. And then we want to go through all the unique values uh, right from our data frame, um, and we should get back like what are the unique teams? These are unique teams, right? And then we can pass that in with our uh, dark guy here. And uh, we'll get those list of colors, mapping teams to this RGB code, which is what we got from Plotly. Um, it turns out that's not what uh, Network, X, Network X wants. They want to have hex codes. Um, so here's some like wacky translator functions. Um, and we can get uh, to what we really want, which is this list of like node colors as, uh, node colors as uh, hex codes, which is hopefully what this is. Um, did we miss something here? I think I missed you. Fantastic. Love it. Um, we were really excited about Dark 2, but it's not going to do what we need. Um, so we probably don't want to use zip here. We'd either want to start replacing uh, or like duplicating colors, which is what a lot of plotting libraries do. Uh, or because um, I don't want to do that right now, um, we can just switch back to whatever we were using before, which happened to have enough colors. Thank you. Very useful. Um, awesome. So now we get the giant list of colors, right? We could pass this in as we make our draw. And we can get out a more exciting diagram, um, which um, kind of looks like uh, a poorly planned Easter egg hunt, maybe. Awesome. But as I mentioned, it, it really needs to have edges to pull it all together. So we could do that next. Um, the, yeah, 
the, we can make this part a little more exciting um, instead of just showing the answer here. But uh, it, it turns out um, the graph is making it really easy for us to look and find these connections. Uh, so when we're defining edges, we want to pass in this iterable saying, like, each of the sources to the targets. Um, and for us, we can pull out that information pretty easily by looking at the nodes. So each node um, in our graph has names, right? And if we look at the data included in the nodes, um, what we want to do is find for each person, find out like who the manager is, right? Um, and so that information is inside the node. And uh, in our little uh, exploration intro to Network X, we also saw that um, we could pull that out directly using like this data argument. So we can say data equals manager, and this is basically just what we need here. This is the sources and the targets, and this is like a big iterable that we can iterate over. Um, and we can just pass it right into uh, our add edges from, um, um, whatchamacallit, add edges from method on our uh, graph, and we can populate this um, based on its uh, notes. So uh, pass that right in. Uh, we can similarly give it some like label like manager, manager equals true. We, we thought that was important before. And then when we draw it, um, it looks like it looks like something. So we've created an organization, um, probably benefiting the world. Uh, we could see that people are reporting into some central node that's purple here. Uh, it's in the middle. Um, and then we have clusterings, right? There's, there's some folks over here on some team, um, other folks on another team. It, it looks like some teams with the same colors have been split up. So potentially not everybody from a team reports to the same team lead, which is good. That doesn't always work that way. Um, but it does look like there's like sub teams all reporting into our CEO in the middle, which is great. Um, but yeah, I think this is a bit of a win. We have something that's vaguely like organization-like. It has this tree structure that we want to see. Uh, there's clusterings of people together. Um, I, I, think, I think at this point, we probably want to like double check that this makes sense. Um, this visualization method doesn't give us a lot of know, a lot of pass through of information. Like I don't really know which team is which. I could look up the colors and figure that out. Uh, I don't really know what people's roles are. I'm assuming that it's in the right order. So something a little more interactive would make this easier to work with. Um, great. So now we want to switch from using Matplotlib, which is great for out of the box, easy integrations with a lot of tools and switch to Plotly. So this is going to be uh, generating our like JavaScript-based plots and then rendering those. And they'll be nice and interactive. Um, so I'll, I'll just sort of walk through this sort of nasty function here. But what we, what we want to do is take our graph, um, which is here, and we want to generate like positions. So when we're calling nx.draw, the flow that's happening is network x is first um, taking all the uh, nodes in the graph and the edges and then deciding where they should be in Euclidean space. And then they're like creating that. So that's called a layout. Um, so the first thing that's happening here is we're going uh, network x dot, um, like I like spring layout because I keep saying springs. And I want the idea of like these are things on springs to, to go through. But there's a, lo a lot of different ones. Um, so we can go spring layout g. And what we should get back is like, uh, uh, I guess it's a set. No, it's a dictionary. Um, and we have each of the like node names and then their position in Euclidean space, right? Little x, y coordinate. This is great. Um, for these kinds of plots, the other one that's really good is a uh, uh, layout. It's a Kamada Kawai layout. Um, but of course, I didn't in install SciPy, so uh, that's not here. So that, that'll chug for a little bit. Um, cool. But there are different layouts we can use uh, depending on how much we want the like physics to go on this. The spring layout is really fast and easy to use. But you might see like a lot of overlapping nodes, whereas uh, something like the Kamada Kawai or um, other uh, more complex um, layout models will, will like run a number of iterations and keep other rules in place that sort of like bounce nodes around and add in things like repulsion, um, which is neat. Um, SciPy is just going to go forever, I guess. Uh, in one minute, it's not that bad. Um, great. So the next thing, we have our positions, right? Names and then uh, x, y coordinates. Um, Plot, uh, Plotly wants a data frame. Um, I mean, it doesn't, but 
we like to use data frames with Plotly. And so now we want to construct a new data frame with the positions, but then also all the information from the graph that we want to use. Uh, so here we have a data frame. We're saying that like there's a label on it, um, which is the label from the node, because um, I'm getting like key value from that positions plot. Um, then I'm getting the x and y coordinates, which are again from that positions, uh, that big dictionary that we created, right? Um, and then here there's like a default size because nodes need a size. And then we're just dumping in the rest of our attributes to repopulate this data frame. Uh, we probably could have just gone back to the data frame we already had before and then put in and merged in the different uh, x, y coordinates with it. But um, you know, we're not, we're not paying by the uh, line of code here or by the hour of compute. Um, awesome. So yeah, like I said, there's other layouts too. We don't have to use the spring layout. Um, there are other options. Um, cool. So there's some more logic in here. Uh, it turns out we had some sets in the data frame, and Plotly doesn't like sets because they're not hashable. Uh, so we can go through and like convert sets to lists. I think we actually dumped this out in the implementation earlier, but like there's some nitty gritty here. Um, the rest of this is trying to like pop out different keyword arguments and pass those through to Plotly if they're Plotly arguments. That's fine. But the the real uh, hero here is we're going to make a scatter plot. We have the x and y coordinates, right? And then we have uh, some data that we can inject into it based on the columns that are in our data frame. Um, we can also, I don't know, like fiddle around with the x-axis and y-axis so it looks nice. Um, and then the last thing we want to do is optionally add in edges as well. So we also have those edges. Um, it turns out this is kind of slow, so um, I made it optional. But uh, here we're going to draw this graph uh, as well. So we create our layout. That's great. We get our edges. Um, we. Um, this is the same function before to make the figure of just nodes. And then we want to add on to that the edges as well. Cool. Um, right, so here we're adding traces into our existing uh, figure. And each of the traces is a single line. This is why it gets like kind of slow. It's a lot of overhead to create these. I didn't think of a better way to do it. If you know one, please tell me. Please let me know for the good of uh, mankind, all of us. Cool. Um, and then here we're sort of shuffling it around. This part is not super exciting, but it allows us to have a nice and expressive, interactive way of viewing our graph, uh, which is what we do want to do. Oh, cool. So what are some things that we want to do? We want to make sure the reporting structure makes sense. So before, we had some rules about who should report to who. And we want to make sure those are in place. You know, we don't want to have, uh, in this case, like the CEO shouldn't report to an engineer or a VP to an engineer, or like salespeople and engineers uh, shouldn't mix, right? They don't talk to each other. Whatever it is in our organization that we've set up, we want to make sure that's happening. Um, we want to make sure that the like job titles make sense. If there's like everyone's a VP, um, it doesn't really make sense. It sounds like a financial firm. Um, okay, you get it. Um, and we want to make sure the locations make sense. We did have rules about who should be in what location. And we, we're pretty sure that worked based on the, um, the bar chart that we looked at before. But it would be good to, to look at that um, in action, too. And as I mentioned, the with edges piece is a bit expensive. Uh, we could try toggling it off if you find it bothersome. Um, great. OK, so um, OK. And I also introduced here, we're just sneaking in new, new features all the time. Um, we could also customize the layout. So before, we mentioned it was using the spring layout. If you really wanted to, you could sub in here. Um, you could change like the function that's being passed in. You could do that Kamada Kawai layout, which I think is pretty cool. And it looked like it actually only took a couple seconds, which seemed like an infinity when I was running this a million times, trying to tweak it. But uh, probably not a big deal now it's working. Um, great, so now our plot function should look a lot like uh, plotly express plot function in that we pass in a data object, right? This is a graph instead of a data frame. Um, and then we define what attributes of that data structure we want to use to generate the appearance, right? So we say like the attribute country should determine the color of the nodes in the graph. Um, this is the layout. And then we say with edges equals false. So I can run this a couple times. Um, we could choose then like what's the name that comes up when I hover over a node. We can decide what are the size of the nodes based on. For us, 
there's only really one column that helps for this, and it's the rank that we uh, made before. But you could also do things like make columns based on like salary or years with company or something like that, a numerical value. And then we can make the nodes bigger or smaller based on that. That might help visually to see. Um, yeah, that would be interesting to see. That actually would be a, a cool thing to add in. And then we can also pass through like what the template should be. Um, so it doesn't burn your eyes. We can use a dark uh, view of this. So yeah, this is what we get out from it. Um, we have this person in the middle, Kelly Flowers, um, who's Irish. Uh, or they live in Ireland. Uh, they are the CEO. Um, I'll run this with the with edges, uh, just so you can see that too. Um, like I mentioned, it takes a really horrendous amount of time to run. Um, it's almost seven seconds. Uh, terrible. But now we can see that view. So this is the same structure we had before. Um, it even is using the same layout, um, which isn't deterministic, but we, we get that same sort of feel from it. Um, there's this like interesting cluster of folks here. Um, so they appear to be, um, what are they? Like a mix of contractors and full-time. They know programming languages, excuse me. But this is the DevX team, right? They're all DevX folks. They're all engineers, and they're all in the USA. Um, I believe they're all in Fort Lauderdale in our example, um, a growing tech hub. Uh, awesome. Um, yeah, and so we also based uh, rank as the size, and so in theory, we should see the circles getting smaller as we go further out from the graph, right? Um, which we kind of see. The biggest one's in the middle. These guys are getting smaller as we go out. Um, and then you know, we have these coloring clusters, which makes sense. But this is a nice way for us to explore and actually visualize the data that's uh, in the nodes, which we weren't doing so well with the network X uh, like default view. And we could have put some more effort into that. Uh, Matplotlib would allow us to like customize that, but it wouldn't allow us to make it interactive in this way. Um, so I couldn't like zoom in and see that this team here, which is uh, sales, is pretty um, diverse across countries. They're in uh, whatever this is, Canada, Great Britain, and the USA. Uh, sales, love them. OK, awesome. And then we could also uh, tweak this and look at other things. So what is this one? This is looking at actual teams. So this is closer to the view we had before, where uh, all the reporting structures should be like all the same color because they're all on the same team reporting up. So it looks uh, vaguely like we did what we wanted to do. This is a good representation of an org. Um, I don't know. Um, it would be a cool extra at this point to like go back, tweak the teams and the structure and the rules, and then keep coming back and looking at this. Now we have like a sample data generator and uh, a visualizer for the organization that's creating, which we're excited about. We're super excited. Um, awesome. So. This is great. Um, we can move on now. Uh, and what we want to look at next is uh, basically what we said this whole time was what we wanted to do was we wanted to build this org with random people, we spend a lot of time making random people. Um, people are hard. And then what we want to do is uh, now add new nodes to the graph just based on attributes uh, that people have. And so this follows the same pattern we did before. Um, but it's, it's useful to sort of look at what we're doing here, um, just to hammer it home. We don't need you on the side there. Um, so we're using some more little funky stuff that I like. Iter tools is fun. If you don't know it, it's a built-in. And more Iter tools mostly just implements the recipes from the docs in uh, Iter tools, which is also great. Um, I advocate it should become uh, one of your standard libraries. Just stick it in every project. Uh, saves you rewriting the same code for like get the first value of this. or like. Um, always iterable means that I can always loop over something, um, even if it's just a single value. Instead of, you know, you always run into that issue where you're looping over a string and you just get out the individual elements of the string. Horrible, right? Um, this solves that problem. It's great. Um, so we made a little function here. It's add nodes from attributes. We give our graph. We tell it the attribute name. And what it's going to do is it's going to go into each node. So we're going to iterate over those nodes um, in the graph, which we can show above here. Um, so say we wanted the attribute of team. Um, the default part's not super important. Um, and now we're getting each person and the team that they're on, right? Um, and so that's what this line is doing. As long as there is an attribute, we're getting out all the attributes of that person, or sorry, the person and that attribute. It could be a list if it was our language's attribute as well. That's sort of why we're using this always iterable thing. Um, then what we're doing is getting a unique, um, a new, unique values for all of these. 
Um, I think we could also have just done like, I don't know, like set this dot values, but maybe this doesn't have a dot values. Uh, uh, yeah, it appears not to. So, you know, we'd have to make it a dictionary first, which is what we're doing in the uh, dic dict comprehension here. Uh, so we're making this uh, map, and then we're finding the unique values. Because what we want to do is take all the unique values from our graph, uh, this attribute. So if it's a team, we'd want to get business, sales, DevOps, DevX. And we want to put those in as nodes. So uh, I won't beleaguer the point too much more. Um, but we loop over that um, using a great number of uh, wacky functions. And then we add those nodes in. And so when we're adding them in, we're saying add in uh, a new node with the name business or DevOps or Python, right? And then add in these flags as well. Um, the flags are very important. Um, it gets confusing now that we have different kinds of nodes in the graph. Uh, we don't want to treat people the same way that we treat Python, um, because they're not the same kind of thing. Um, awesome. So we can do that for a couple different things. We can add nodes from attributes for languages and give it some flag, um, city, um, and give it some flag, uh, TZ for time zone. Um, not entirely important that we make the flags different, but it could cause trouble later, uh, depending on how we use it. Um, but right, now we have new nodes in the plot, in the graph. Um, in theory, if we took like, a quick look at it with our px plot nxg thing, um, I probably needed to pass in one of these things, like color equals. Uh, Team, but it doesn't like that. Yeah, um, you know we have we have the same plot we had before. Um, just a little hard on the eyes. Um, yes, but we've now added in new um, new little uh, what should we call it? It's new nodes, right? So they just popped up here based on the logic of our other uh, plot. So we have like the languages now. So we have. Um, TypeScript, uh, Java, Erlang, right? So it found those, and now we have those nodes in the graph. This is great. This is what we wanted. Uh, now we need to connect the edges. So we can do pretty much the same thing we did, but did before with Manager, um, and the same sort of structure that we used just before to add the nodes in, in order to uh, loop through, find all of the unique uh, attribute nodes, and then connect people to those nodes. So here we're finding, uh, what is it? Um, this is, well, we're here, the, the way to filter a graph. So we can get a subgraph that um, meets a certain filter requirement, um, right? So we define here uh, just people as a filter. Um, basically, it goes over each node in the graph, and then it runs this on it. And so it says, like, if, uh, if the node that's in that uh, graph at that key is, has this person flag, we keep them. If not, we throw them away. Um, we don't want to, I think it's mostly to avoid errors in this implementation, but we don't want to, like Python doesn't code JavaScript, right? I mean, it kind of does in that plotly right now that we're using is using JavaScript. But I think that would be like a strange thing to add into our uh, graph. It might complicate things, although I'm kind of interested in it now that I've just said it. Um, awesome. Um, cool. So that we could go in and do that for edges as well, right? So now we have uh, languages. Let's add time zone and city. And then when we look at this, we should get something. Um, I guess this is it. Um, that looks like our team structure, but it's been it's been warped now. So we have not just people being arranged by how they're reporting, but they're also being arranged, um, being pulled and pushed right um, by each other and these um, new things: language, city, and time zone. So it'd be useful here to. Did I have one with edges? No. Uh, it would be useful to run this with edges, um, but this will take longer. Um, but now we should be able to see teams that are on, so we can still keep that. But what we should see is teams starting to mix now. Um, some, some of the um, things that might hamper that when we're looking at the plot um, is the fact that we have some overlap between teams. Because we made team derivative of country and like time zones related to country and uh, roles are related to teams, right? So we, m we might have some like uh, carryover there. But what we should see is, Especially in this area, um, oh, so that's time zone. Um, but we have folks from uh, the. Anyways, it, it's no longer nice tight bundles of people from the same team. There are other factors that are now pulling them and causing them to mix around, right? Um, so this is all just based in the graph. Um, we focused a bunch on making the visualization, but really, like the logic and the intelligence is all in the graph. 
And when we assembled the graph, it was a couple lines of code, right? Like we just pulled in the people, added the edges. We had this new logic in order to figure out how you deal with attributes that aren't people. So we flag them in a different way. We can, we can separate them and look at them. Um, but now we have this like, more complicated graph. Uh, but maybe Paul Ray and uh, Catherine Mendoza should get to know each other. They're both people. Um, Catherine's on the product team. Paul's on the platform team. But uh, what is it? Do they know languages? Neither of them know any languages. So that's great. You know? uh, <laughs> uh, great example. That one just came out. Um, I have a bunch of extra things that you might be interested in if you want to follow down. Um, there's some other parts of NetworkX that allow us to, like, from this point, just identify what communities there are uh, algorithmically. So one is an ego graph. Uh, you can do an ego graph around a node, and it returns to you like a subgraph um, of people that are connected within x steps or like within a certain radius, um, depending on how you've set up your edges. Uh, for us, you could set that like radius equals two, and that would return to, to you anybody who is either uh, connected directly to your manager. Right or to someone that reports to you, so like that's the one two, um, or uh, anyone that goes through a point like Python. So then my new like ego graph is like anybody that knows the same languages is in the same country, right? So that's like one way we could do it. It's kind of naive. Um, it doesn't take into account how these other attributes are connected. Uh, so like you would lose the fact that lots of people that know Python also know uh, JavaScript. And then maybe I want to be closer with those people, just based on the fact that people who know this also know this. These communities are more tightly related than maybe um, Erlang and JavaScript, right? Uh, but that wouldn't necessarily come out with this naive approach. But that's something we can do. Um, you can also use this uh, all pairs node connectivity, and it gives you a big dump of like a matrix of all of these things. Um, another uh, way we could do it is we can make the spring layout, and then calculate what the positions are, and then do like a, a Euclidean distance between all the different uh, pairs of points. And then I can make some rule and draw a circle. So this takes into account, this is basically what we're doing visually. We're rendering the graph, and then we're looking at an area and saying, like, this makes sense. This is similar, and we're letting the physics do the work. Um, and then finally, uh, OK, so that's the physics doing the work. Um, cool. But it's uh, really the same approach in spirit uh, to representing the graph in more than two dimensions. Uh, and then doing like a, a distance metric between them as well. So our, our layout right now is set to two dimensions because it's a lot easier to view. Uh, but if you use a library like Node algorithm like Node -Devec, we can take this uh, graph and it'll dump it immediately into like n-dimensional vector space. And then you can look and see like what's close to what. Um, that's great. Uh, it also plays well with uh, pipating to something like a k-means clustering or like other typical clustering algorithms that you would do. Um, in vector space, um, which is like a well-trod path. Uh, so we can get our graph there, and then it's easy to determine communities. Um, there's a few other uh, algorithms uh, in Network X, including in the communities uh, module, that are great for that as well. Um, and I have some like links to them all in the docs, but we don't really have time to get into that uh, today. OK, so uh, in the last couple minutes, uh, we want to get to actually building the interactive app, right? Um, so let's jump into that. So what we want to do is use uh, Dash. So if we're not familiar with Dash, it is a Python-based library that wraps around, uh, sorry about that, wraps around React and uh, Flask, and it'll generate little apps. So here's an example of a Dash app, really simple one. Um, we have a layout. This is like the wireframe for the app. And everything is these HTML objects. And they are, surprisingly, the same as HTML objects in HTML. HTML, HTML. Um, so here we have a little header. We have a paragraph with something in it, and then a button. Um, the other intricacy to this is we define callbacks, and this is rules for what happens when something changes. So here we wrote a rule, and we said when the input, which is this button, um, when the end clicks property, which is the number of times it's been clicked, uh, changes, uh, we should run this function, update title on button click. And the return value from this function should be piped into uh, this, the output. So title children. Um, so this is a great way to, I don't know, it works. This is how Dash works. Um, so if we ran this app, um, what we're saying is that, uh, yep, so the output is the title, which is this asimple app header. And uh, we're saying that it should be changed to this value when the button click happens. And so really quickly, we can uh, look at that. This is our app, right? 
It is a simple app, and when I click this, something happens, right? Fantastic. So now we have a mechanism uh, in Python to expose our graph, and we just need a way to visualize it. And then we have a lot of different components that we can use to interact with it, change the values, maybe redraw it, maybe color it differently. What we were doing manually with Plotly, um, but now we can do in a uh, way that we can expose to users or just generally do uh, without messing around with the code. Uh, the other thing that's interesting um, about Dash is we can also make it a bit more complicated and look a bit nicer using Bootstrap. There's a couple different frameworks, not just Bootstrap. Um, Mantine is another really uh, popular one that you can use with Dash that are wrapped up into it. But essentially now we're doing the same thing you would do with a Bootstrap app um, with DBC instead of HTML. And we can define uh, all the elements in here. So um, yeah, generally, I don't have much to say about this other than layouts. Usually, you make a container. You put rows in it. There's columns. That's Bootstrap. Um, and then you can do things like, here's our headers and inputs. And uh, we can have different inputs for things. So uh, this app is pretty simple. Um, it unfortunately uh, lints into a kind of wild structure here. Um, but what we're doing is we're going to have a little callback where we generate new paragraphs. Um, and that's something you could run with, like, uh, um, yeah, generate paragraphs, and we change the way it works based on um, based on uh, the inputs. I appear to have broken it. Oh, fake is not defined. Mm. We uh, did not run the cell that comes after this, which is a reasonable thing to do. OK. Mm -hmm. Cool, 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 cool. So now we can run this Bootstrap app, which is not the main event, but um, it just has random code, or sorry, random text. Um, but now we have, like, it's kind of nicer looking. We could spend a lot more time making this nice, but I'm right. I'm, I'm changing things, and it's altering things. Python code is running, right? I can increase the number of sentences that are in it. Um, awesome. So this is all we need to build our interactive app. This is the framework for it. Um, now all we need to do is take our, um, take our graph and uh, make elements that Cytoscape likes. So if we read the docs for Cytoscape, it turns out it wants something uh, in the format of uh, like a dictionary of a, or a list of dictionaries where we have the elements and they should have data in them um, and other attributes, right? Uh, it turns out Network X, uh, oops, and Network Network X plays with this very well. We can just generate the the format that we need from it, and it's going to dump out the graph represented for Cytoscape. Um, so the graph itself doesn't have data, but it does have elements, and the elements are like nodes, and there's a data element in it, and it has these things all dumped out. So this makes it pretty easy for us. We can pipe this right into Cytoscape, and it'll be happy. Um, it also has information about like whether the graph is directed or it's a multigraph, uh, meaning that there could be multiple um, edges uh, between the same two uh, points. Um, not really important for us, um, but that makes that part easy. And uh, all we do in this function here, create graph, is bundle together some of the logic from the last couple um, notebooks that we worked through. So now we're making this directed graph. Um, we're adding the nodes from people, right? Just adding the nodes. And then we're going to allow it as a function to pass in a list of attributes. And then we'll loop through and do that um, attribute node and edge thing that we were doing before. Um, fantastic. So pretty simple logic. It's boiling down uh, a lot of what we've done in the past hour and a bit into uh, an embarrassingly small amount of code. Um, but really, like we don't have to revisit that again. Now we just want to focus on like tweaking this, adding new stuff, uh, and then being able to explore the graph. Um, right. And then lastly, for creating elements, we're just taking the nodes and the edges um, from that uh, dump from um, Network X and putting it into a big list together. We just put them all in together. Fantastic. Awesome. The last piece that we could spend a lot of time on is Cytoscape um, will render all the nodes um, using a layout. So we'll provide that later. But then it styles all the nodes using a style sheet. And the way that we define this is using uh, a list of dictionaries here. But we create selectors. And the selectors will look at the values of or the types of the nodes and objects in the graph. And then it'll also potentially look at the, the data inside of it and then style things differently. 
This is all going to be happening on the JavaScript side, um, which makes it pretty quick. Um, also limiting if we're like really scaling the size up. Uh, but here we're going to do some basic stuff like, say, nodes. So this is any node. We should say it should have a certain font size and a certain color. right? We can say the same for edges. There's lots to customize here. If you go into the Cytoscape JS docs, you can uh, all of that copies over here. And then we can do some more um, customized stuff based on the values we're expecting. Um, so we're going to say any edge that has languages equals true, and that's what this means um, in its data, is going to have a label on it. And we're going to define the label here. We could also do this more generally and have like a label in the attribute data, and then just point at the data and say, your label is whatever is in attribute name or attribute label, right? All, all options. Um, and then we can do things like say, like, OK, any nodes that aren't people, let's make them smaller and make the text big. Um, and we'll sort of have like that view, right? Um, awesome. So we can do that. And then lastly, we dumped in a little uh, node color style sheet. So this is doing the same sort of logic we did before to make the, the node color list for network X, where we're going through finding the unique values. And then we are going to be uh, mapping those, mapping those on, and writing a bunch of rules into our style sheet for that. Fantastic. OK. Uh, the last piece, uh, which is also um, lots of information here, um, we want to set up a Cyto layout. Um, so here we're using uh, COS, uh, which is a spring layout, uh, because we've been doing springs the whole time. But there's a, a list of different ones you can pick from from uh, the Cytoscape site. Um, and then there's a bunch of uh, initialization parameters for here. Um, the key ones that I think matter is node overlap. So that's uh, saying like how close nodes are allowed to be to each other uh, before like they're being repulsed. Um, the other one, uh, node repulsion, kind of does the same thing. Um, node dimension include labels means that all the labels we're going to display for our nodes should be included in the bounding box for the node. So this will give more space. It also potentially will make the graph kind of big and wonky if you have big names, because now the node appears really large. Um, and then number of iterations will just uh, be how many times uh, the physics engine runs over and over again. Fantastic. So now we can uh, define our app. We can give it a nice little dark theme. Um, and then if we want to, we can start to add in attribute drop downs. Um, I don't think we'll have time to like entirely implement these, so I'll kind of skim over it. Um, but right, our layout for our app is just going to be a Cytoscape object. Into it, we're going to define our layout. This will stay the same. Um, we're going to say, uh, well, style it so that it takes up some space. We pass in our elements. And here, we decided that the element should include these attributes, language, country. Right. This is easy now to tweak and rerun. And then the style sheet. And we said the style sheet should be themed dark. And then we should color nodes by country. Okay. Um, so now we have all the pieces we need. Uh, the rest of this is some bootstrap. and. Uh, tossing it in. Um, but we should be now ready to run this and uh, take a look. Um, cool. So this was what we kind of promised we'd do. It's the same view we would have had in Plotly, right? Um, but now we can come in uh, and explore the plot a bit more. Our edges have names and labels. Uh, I can see things like, um, I don't know, I guess the people didn't have labels in our implementation here. But this person codes Scala and TypeScript. Uh, and they're blue, which would mean they're on a certain team. Um, and we can uh, sort of explore this. We can change the size of all these things, like I mentioned. Um, but this is our nice interactive plot. Um, what we won't have time to get into is exploring um, all of the different uh, callbacks that we can do on the graph. Um, but this is the fundamentals that we need in order to um, visualize and then explore our graph in Dash Cytoscape. Right? Um, the, the idea being. Um, what we could do is take these drop-down attributes and bind these to, um, through pretty simple callbacks, bind these to the inputs for our generate elements and for our style sheet. Right? So right now, that's happening at uh, page load time in the elements and style sheet um, inputs to the, to the graph. But these are also easy to add in uh, as callbacks, because uh, here we have a Cyto layout with a certain network. And all we need to do is make a callback that's changing network and then the style sheet or network and the elements. And we can do that whenever we're toggling our drop downs. Uh, so that will make it nice and easy for us to add in a bunch of attributes, redraw the graph, um, and then see how those connections work. 
uh, as well as we could toggle like what colors are being used to draw that. Um, so I, I'm thinking we have all the pieces we need throughout the last couple notebooks for you to implement that, which is exciting. Um, and, and that is like the core pieces of what we want to do in the graph. Um, awesome. That is that's everything I wanted to talk about today. Thanks for coming along on the trip. Um, and yeah, if, if you weren't following along, which is fine, uh, it's all up on my GitHub, and the link is in the PyData schedule. So definitely check that out. Does anyone have like quick questions or anything at the end? If not, I'll, I'll talk for like one more minute about. Uh, um, yeah, so I think Dash and Cytoscape is a really powerful way to take uh, the analysis you're already doing in Python and make a really functional uh, user interface for it. Um, it's a, I think adding in this bootstrap element as well can give it a nice, pretty view without a lot of effort. Um, but you don't need to do this as well. It does cloud your code up a bit, adding in more and more pieces. Um, but, but really, this is a powerful way to expose this to other people. Uh, so yeah, the link to the running app is also available. Um, I deployed it with Google uh, App Engine. It was pretty easy. It took seven or eight minutes, which is exciting. Um, yeah, yeah. Again, just thanks to everyone for coming out. It's been fun. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>